in the syllabus, the um, there will this was given to them yesterday, so an updated version of the syllabus, but I guess they hadn't been able to update the syllabus. So it has been sent to ASC and the staff have it. So when you go through some of these, just to remind yourselves, a little bit's the same, but I spent some time trying to simplify things through some of the algorithms. So take a look in the, in the syllabus later. Well, I guess it's Sunday, so the person that updates them is not actually even here, but I just wanted to let you know. We'll go through this evaluation for uh, prosthetic valve dysfunction. I have nothing with which to disclose. I begin with the case of a 55-year-old woman. Status post mitral valve replacement. She had three mitral valve replacements. Most recent was in 1999, where she had a mechanical mitral prosthesis. She's now NYJ functionally class two with an increase in her right ventricular systolic pressure. Here we see the parasternal long axis view the chamber dimensions, the LV ejection fraction here is reported at 53% with an RVSP of 58 millimeters of mercury. And we can see here the mitral prosthesis, the occluders appear to be uh, moving reasonably well. Here we see color from the apical view. This is left ventricle, left atrium. And to begin our evaluation of the mitral prosthesis, we then look at the spectral Doppler mitral inflow velocity profile, CW velocity. And we see the amplitude of the E wave here is 2.4 meters per second. The mean gradient is 9 millimeters of mercury. So one of the first things when looking at Doppler parameters of mitral valve function is to look at the peak velocity and to look at the mean gradient. And in this patient, both the peak velocity was elevated over 1.9 meters per second. The mean gradient was elevated. It was over 5 millimeters of mercury. So when we see an increase in the mitral inflow E-wave velocity and an increase in the, in the mean gradient, there are three possibilities. One, there's pathologic stenosis, thrombus panis, thrombus panis degeneration. Or it can be functional stenosis, due to high flow or tachycardia or this concept of prosthesis patient mismatch. Or it could be significant regurgitation, prosthetic or perhaps periprosthetic regurgitation. So the increase in the E-wave velocity and the mean gradient is a clue that there's something wrong. And then we need to then look at our other parameters to help sort this through. So we can begin by looking at this TVI ratio. Remember, for the mitral prosthesis TVI ratio, that's the TVI through the mitral prosthesis divided by the LVOT TVI. And we're reminded that this is the inverse or exactly the opposite of looking at the TVI ratio when we talk about aortic prosthesis tomorrow. Where with aortic prosthesis, the LVOT TVI is on the numerator of the equation. For the mitral prosthesis, it is the denominator of the equation. So it's the inverse when looking at the mitral prosthesis TVI ratio. So here, a TVI ratio, say over about 2.2, would be abnormal. So why would that be? If flow is equal to area times the TVI, then the TVI is increased either because the area is low or flow is increased. So we need to then look at other things such as the orifice area and concepts of the pressure half time. Remember the pressure half time, it is derived from the deceleration slope of the E wave on the Doppler spectral display here of the transmitral flow. And we heard this this morning. We're not asked what's the velocity half time. They ask us what's the pressure half time. And on the exam, they're likely will not give you the pressure half time. They'll give you the deceleration time. And we just need to remember that the pressure half time is 29% of the deceleration time. And if the pressure half time is prolonged over 130 milliseconds, that's pathologic stenosis. If the pressure half time is short, then it could be a normal valve, but not if the E wave velocity is high and the mean gradient is increased, then we need to think of either pathologic regurgitation or functional stenosis. So here is an example courtesy of my friend and colleague, Dr. Nakomo. Two patients, both had 29 millimeter porcine mitral prosthesis. 
The patients both had an E-wave velocity of 2.3 meters per second and a mean gradient of 9 millimeters of mercury. On the left, the patient's pressure halftime is prolonged, over 130 milliseconds. This is pathologic stenosis. The patient on the right, pressure halftime is short. And so what could this be? It's not pathologic stenosis, it's either functional stenosis or can be significant regurgitation. So we need to look at the other Doppler parameters, right? So we'll begin by looking at this TVI ratio. And the TVI ratio in this case was 2.0, it's low. That means there's not more flow going across the mitral prosthesis than we would expect based on the flow coming through the LVOT. So this cannot be significant regurgitation. This, therefore, is going to be functional stenosis, either high flow tachycardia or this concept of prosthesis patient mismatch. So the only thing we have left to do is look at the indexed orifice area. And this indexed orifice area, we'll go through this as low at 0.73 centimeters squared per meter squared. So this patient would have prosthesis patient mismatch. Based on an indexed area less than 1.2 would be moderate. Less than 0.9 centimeters squared per meter squared would be severe prosthesis patient mismatch. So if we go back to our patient, peak velocity 2.4, mean gradient is 9, the pressure half time is 115 milliseconds, and the TVI ratio is 2.3. So the question is, what can we say about this mitral prosthesis? Normal regurg stenosis, normal functioning mixed stenosis and regurgitation. I'm not sure if the questions will come up. So in the interest of time, let's, oh, it, it did come up. So people said that there was half said prosthetic stenosis, uh, excuse me, prosthetic regurgitation, and some said normal functioning prosthesis. So a pretty even split. Well, that's very even split. I can't believe this is voting. But uh, only one vote per person, so I guess that's pretty easy. So let's just take a look at this. And I, I promise you that I gave this syllabus in the other day, so this isn't exactly what I saw walking up, but this has been put in, so you will see this kind of algorithm that I, has been adopted from a courtesy of Dr. Blauet, really, to some extent. So if we see the mechanical prosthesis and the pressure half time is short, it's 115 milliseconds, then we need to decide what's the TVI ratio. It was 2.3, so this patient would have pathologic regurgitation. And if we look at the TEE, we can see this large perivalvular jet of regurgitation. We did not appreciate that from the transthoracic imaging because in transthoracic imaging, the left atrium is in the far field and the ultrasound cannot penetrate through the mitral prosthesis. It's like Superman can't look through steel. The sound waves can't look through the steel of the prosthesis. And therefore, we may not see the color jet in, Paris, in the transthoracic imaging. Not the best 3D, but this patient underwent plugging of the perivalvular leak. So for prosthetic regurgitation, the clues are that the increase in E-wave velocity and mean gradient, but a short pressure half time and a high TVI ratio. Here's a 30-year-old woman, status post St. Jude MVR, she's transferred in cardiogenic shock. Here's the peristernal long axis view, and it always happens in the middle of the night. You can see the timing of this, it's around midnight. The right ventricle is dilated, the LV is underfilled. We can sort of see the prosthesis here. Here's the color Doppler of the, of the mitral prosthesis. Here's the spectral Doppler mitral velocity profile, a rocket E-wave velocity of 3.5, a mean gradient of 40 millimeters of mercury, and I just say the pressure half time went on forever. So this patient clearly had significant prosthetic stenosis. Why? Because the pressure half time was more than 130 milliseconds, and therefore this patient's mean gradient is 40. This represents pathologic obstruction. And so, if we take a look at the transesophageal echocardiogram, you can appreciate that these occluders are literally stuck and not moving. And when we look more closely at these 2D images, you can see this mobile echo density here, this sort of amorphous echo density sitting here on the left atrial side on top of the valve occluders. This is the 3D image we took, and I was able to show this sort of amorphous structure here. This is really a thrombus that's gluing together these leaflets and they're simply not moving. So this patient would have prosthetic 
mitral valve thrombosis. And so what would the guidelines tell us to do? It would tell us to do a transthoracic echo to evaluate its hemodynamic severity, and in the past, it was a class 2A indication to then do CT and fluoroscopy to evaluate valve motion. This is now a class 1 indication in the updated guidelines. And because it's a left-sided thrombosis, it's reasonable to do TEE to look at thrombosis size. In the past, they'd say if you had class three or four symptoms, this would be emergency surgery, but now symptoms of valve obstruction, it can be either emergency surgery or slow infusion fibrinolytic therapy. Because it's a left-sided uh, thrombosis, it would be reasonable to do TE to look at the mobility and size of that thrombus, and if it's big, greater than 0.8 square centimeters in the past, they said emergency surgery. Now they say either emergency surgery or slow infusion fibrinolytic therapy. But appreciate this, that if the thrombus size was small, recent onset and not really class three or four, that you would start with IV heparin and then consider fibrinolytic therapy if that didn't work. So there still is a role for TE to look at thrombus size, notwithstanding the fact that if you have a large mobile thrombus in a hemodynamically very unstable patient, this may favor your approach to surgical intervention over slow infusion fibrinolytic therapy. This patient underwent valve replacement with a 2729 onyx mechanical valve. How about this 84-year-old woman, MVR with a bioprosthesis now in 2012? was functionally class one, but in the past three months has become more short of breath and is NYHA functionally class three. Here we see a transesophageal echocardiogram, and you might appreciate that at least this leaflet that we see here is not moving very well. We look here, here's color Doppler. We don't see much in the way of regurgitation, but we see this flow acceleration through the mitral prosthesis. Here the mean gradient is 10 with a pressure half time of 141 milliseconds. So what can we say about this mitral prosthesis? <coughs> so let's take a look here. This patient's pressure half time was prolonged greater than 130 milliseconds. So once the pressure halftime is prolonged, this is going to be pathologic obstruction. High E-way velocity mean gradient give us a clue that there's a problem. The next step is to look at the pressure halftime. If it's prolonged, this is going to be pathologic obstruction. Here the gradient was 10, and so this represents pathologic obstruction. Please appreciate, as you get this in your syllabus, that in the mitral prosthesis, a slightly different TVI ratio here and gradients, so subtly different, but I don't think for the exam, I think what we really need to remember is a value over about 2.2. Here is the transesophageal echo. This is from the left atrial perspective, and you can see this amorphous material that's really gluing down these leaflets. This one leaflet appears to open well. This patient had blood cultures. The blood cultures were negative. And so the question would be, what would you recommend now? Should we redo surgery, valve and valve mitral, thrombolytic therapy, or warfarin? And for the interest of time, I suppose we can see that, um, so most people, well, a pretty even split, I guess the only two or three votes here, but warfarin wins, and that's probably the correct answer, that we would consider warfarin therapy. This is a patient that had bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. The prevalence of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis is somewhere in the range of 10 to 12 percent, and it does not appear to vary based on the position of that valve. So the prevalence is the same from aortic mitral tricuspid valves. The incidence of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis in these roughly 6,100 uh, valves is somewhere in the range of about 0.74%. But of these 6,100 valves, only about 3,100 underwent echo follow-up. So if we looked at that, the incidence would be about 1.5%. So the prevalence is around 10%. The incidence is about 1%.
What about anticoagulation for prosthetic valves? The guidelines in the past had told us that if you have a bioprosthetic mitral valve, we give vitamin K antagonist Coumadin to a goal INR of 2.5 for the first three months. That has changed now to the first three to six months as a class 2A indication, followed by antiplatelet therapy. For bioprosthetic aortic valves in the past, it was a class 2B indication for Coumadin to a target INR of 2.5 for the first three months. Now it's exactly the same as for bioprosthetic mitral valves. For transcatheter valves, it's a class 2B indication to give vitamin K antagonists for the first three months, again with a target INR of 2.5. It's interesting, if you look at the bioprosthetic valve thrombosis time that it is most frequently seen Interesting, in that year two, between 12 and 24 months. And that's important because if we look at the guidelines, and this I think we need to remember, but I want to make a clinical point and an exam point here. This is the exam point. What do the guidelines tell us? They say we should do an initial transthoracic echo af immediately after so we have some baseline hemodynamics with which to follow. But then we would repeat the transthoracic echocardiogram for these prosthetic valves if there was a change in clinical symptoms or signs suggesting valve dysfunction. Otherwise, annual transthoracic is reasonable with bioprosthetic valves after the first 10 years, even in the absence of a change in clinical status. But that interests me. So what you need to remember for the exams is that the guidelines now say, well, you don't need to follow them for 10 years unless there's a change in status. But clinically, I kind of wonder if bioprosthetic valve thrombosis is most common between year one and two, will we not be interested in looking at those valves a little bit earlier? Again, if you look at aortic mitral tricuspid bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, occurs much earlier than structural valve deterioration that we see in blue, regardless of the valve position. How do we identify bioprosthetic valve thrombosis? Try to remember these few tips. These are patients that the mean gradient has increased by 50% from the baseline that you take in immediately after surgery. The cusps look thick. The cusps may be immobile. Patients with atrial fibrillation and the subtherapeutic INR, all of these would suggest the possibility of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. TE is recommended if the transthoracic is abnormal but this is very, most valuable in the mitral position, less valuable in the aortic position. It's just harder to see the aortic valve on FOS. And therefore, CT can be extremely helpful in both mitral and aortic, but particularly aortic for bioprosthetic valve thromboses. And here we can see that the treatment with vitamin K antagonists versus non-vitamin K antagonists, which is thrombolytic therapy uh, or surgery, shows that they have a similar outcome with just vitamin K antagonists, and that's why the primary treatment is Coumadin. And this is the same whether we talk about mitral valves or aortic valves or tricuspid valves with bioprosthetic valve thrombosis. And here we just see this patient after six weeks of Coumadin therapy, we can see that the leaflets are opening now. There's much less of that mass that we had seen earlier. How long should we continue the anticoagulation? And who really knows, but our practice, of course, is long-term anticoag lifelong anticoagulation. If they develop bioprosthetic valve thrombosis off of Coumadin for no apparent reason, then I think we should continue with Coumadin long-term. This is just the clinical incidence of bioprosthetic valve thrombosis in transcatheter valves. It's a little more common in the balloon expanding versus self-expanding valves. The median time to diagnosis is about a half a year, and TE and CT are quite ideal to identify as we showed its presence, and they respond well to anticoagulation therapy. A systematic approach might be we just need to recognize its possibility. And then remember, this is a clinical comment, not necessarily an exam comment, but maybe it's worth looking at these patients in years one and two because of the higher incidence. But what we need to know for the exam is that if the gradient is increased by 50%, the valves are thickened and immobile, the patients in atrial fibrillation now, they have a low INR. We need to continue to think about bioprosthetic valve thrombosis with TE and CT scan. And if it, we suspect it, a trial of anticoagulation is reasonable. Here's a 52-year-old woman, mitral valve repair in 1997 for regurgitation secondary to prolapse. A redo in 2001, but was left with some stenosis. And so in 2014, had a mitral valve replacement with a 25-millimeter St. Jude prosthesis. The patient 
presents with NYT class two symptoms and was thought to have mitral valve stenosis. So here we take a look at the TEE. Here on the left, 2D image, and here we see color Doppler. Looks like the occluders are working pretty well. We don't see much regurgitation and it's TEE, so the color's in the near field here. We begin by looking at the spectral Doppler of the mitral inflow, the continuous wave Doppler. We get a peak velocity of 2.1 and a mean gradient of 8 at a heart rate of 66 beats per minute. So that velocity is higher than 1.9. The mean gradient is over 5. That's a clue that there's probably something wrong with this valve. We then look at the pressure halftime. The pressure halftime is short. The TVI ratio is 1.9. And so we go back and we can say, what can we say about this valve? Is this a normal prosthesis? Is there regurgitation? stenosis? Is this a normal functioning prosthesis? Or do we need more information? And so when we take a look at this valve, we can see, let's go to these algorithms, and again, we'll see this in, in their updated syllabus, but here we can see the mechanical mitral prosthesis. The pressure halftime was short. It was 108 milliseconds. So it's not obstructed. The next thing we need to do was to look at the TVI ratio. And the TVI ratio is 1.9. So we know this is not likely going to be pathologic regurgitation. It pushes us to the left. So the next thing we need to do is evaluate the indexed effective orifice area for that valve. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we can say, well, maybe the index, the, or the orifice area is, we heard was 220 over pressure half time, so that's 220 over 108. That gives us a value of two square centimeters. But this would be incorrect. This 220 over pressure half time was derived for patients with native mitral valve stenosis and cannot be used in patients with prosthetic valves, bioprosthetic, mechanical prosthesis, because it's largely influenced by changes in LA and LV compliance. So if we want to calculate the effective orifice area in a mitral prosthesis, we need to do this by continuity. We need the stroke volume as the numerator which is the area of the LVOT times the LVOT TVI, as long as there's no significant MR and AR, and then divide it by the TVI through the prosthetic mitral valve. And here we would get a valve area of 1.35 square centimeters. If we index that to body surface area, this gives us a valve area index of 0 0.67 centimeters squared per meter squared. So if we go down this algorithm, we can see that this patient would have prosthesis patient mismatch. So we take a look, there's normal occluder function, there's no regurgitation. We see this indexed orifice area here is really quite low. And this concept is really the fact that this patient was given a valve that's functioning just fine, but it's just too darn small for the size of that individual. Remind ourselves that in the mitral position, an indexed orifice area less than 1.2 centimeters squared per meter squared represents moderate prosthesis patient mismatch. Less than 0.9 would be severe prosthesis patient mismatch. So just remember 1.2 and 0.9 in the mitral position. So if the patients do have this patient prosthesis or prosthesis patient mismatch, their risk for persistent pulmonary hypertension, poor exercise tolerance, and in fact, they have a worse long-term survival shown here, that as you have more severe prosthesis patient mismatch, these individuals have a worse long-term survival. A strategy to avoid prosthesis patient mismatch. Something to think about. In the mitral position, we said less than 1.2 centimeters squared per meter squared would be considered moderate prosthesis patient mismatch. So if we just take the body surface area, multiply it by this number, then you got to pick a valve off the shelf that has referenced values that would be bigger than this. When you talk about aortic prosthesis tomorrow, remember it's a slightly different number for moderate and severe prosthesis patient mismatch, but the same concept their body surface area and pick a valve off the shelf that has an indexed area 
that would, or a valve area that would be greater than this. A 75-year-old woman has rheumatic heart disease, had a 21-millimeter supraepic bioprosthesis in the aortic position, a 29-millimeter bioprosthetic valve in the mitral position. She's now functionally class 3, iron deficiency anemia, intermittent packed red blood cell transfusions for the past number of years. This is an interesting case that I had just about six months or so ago. This is the parasternal long axis view. So we're looking at this mitral prosthesis. Here we have it 2D color. You will now look in the apical view, left ventricle, left atrium. Here's color. The next thing we do is we look at the continuous wave Doppler of the mitral inflow, characterized by the amplitude of the E wave, 2.6. The mean gradient here is elevated at 9 millimeters of mercury. That's a clue. High E wave velocity, high mean gradient tells you something's wrong. So what do we need to do? We need to look at the pressure half time, and we need to look at the TBI ratio, 120 and 3.1. So we ask ourselves, what's the problem? Well, the pressure half time is short. It was 120. Then we, the next thing we need to do is look at the TBI ratio. It's 3.1. This patient has pathologic regurgitation. Man, I didn't see that at all on the color Doppler. But when we look more closely, we can say, hey, here, again, this is the transthoracic. I zoom. It's really hard to see. You might get a clue, but it's really hard to see significant mitral regurgitation. And I wonder, you know, Superman can't look through steel. Ultrasound can't look through the, the prosthesis, and therefore maybe we're missing this, but the TVI ratio is high. We need to explain that if measured correctly. So this patient went on to have TEE. And just take a look right here. This leaflet seems to be the hist from the annulus. I zoom this up to take a closer look. And then when we put on color, you can see this color flow that's going right through here. We see this large pizza, and this is just a nice jet almost hitting here the side wall of the left atrial appendage. So this patient had significant prosthetic mitral regurgitation. Big E wave velocity, high mean gradient. We need to explain that. So the next thing we said is the TVI ratio was more than 2.2, was elevated. That means there's more flow going across the mitral prosthesis than we would expect going through the aortic prosthesis, as long as the pressure half time is short. If the pressure half time is long, we're done, that's mitral stenosis, because mitral stenosis would have a high TVI ratio too, but a high TVI ratio with a long pressure half time. Short pressure half time, it's not inflow obstruction. So the TVI ratio is an important clue. And I leave you with just this last case in the last seven minutes, but I will be done before that, I promise. We've got some questions. So a 32-year-old male, well, better go slowly because I don't want to answer the questions in case I can't <laughs> answer them. The, uh, <laughs> a 32-year-old male, this was very recent, a study that I did, the Lois Dietz syndrome, aortic root and a 21-millimeter onyx AVR and mitral valve repair in 2017, reduced sternotomy with a mitral valve a repair in, with a 31, 33 millimeter onyx mitral prosthesis in September of 2017. So the mitral valve repair wasn't maybe a good idea in this patient with connective tissue disease. And now uh, presents with iron, comes to us because I've had recurrent iron deficiency anemia. And here we take a look at the transesophageal echocardiogram. You can see that the occluders seem to be moving pretty normally. Here's color. So we look at the peak velocity, 1.9, right on the point, cut point. Mean gradient is 5, right in the, like this is, this is the way life is, right? Right in the middle. The pressure half time is short. The TVI ratio, though, may be a little higher than we would expect at 2.3. So the question is, what can we say about this prosthesis? And for the interest of time, we know, again, the pressure, I keep showing the same thing, the pressure half time is short. This is, cannot be inflow obstruction. The TVI ratio here is 2.3. That would suggest 
that there's pathologic regurgitation. And I didn't see any regurgitation. Here we're looking at a three-dimensional image of the tricuspid, uh, the mitral valve from the left atrial perspective. Cluders we saw were working well. Clue here is when we put on color, we can see these two jets of perivalvular regurgitation. Wasn't quite seen in the 2D uh, image. And this may be a reason for the iron deficiency anemia. And interestingly, not as pretty a picture as the ones that Dr. Lang has shown me in the past, but this concept of transillumination I think was quite interesting and valuable because what we've done is we are looking from the left atrial perspective through this valve, but we've put the light source not sitting up looking from the LA down through the LV, but we've put the light source in the back, so the light's now from the LV shining right up to us. And when we do that, and I slow this down, you can begin to see where this leak is and get a sense of the anatomy, the extent of that leak, and helps us to define whether these, this leak could be addressed simply through uh, perivalvular uh, plug closure, which we'll probably hear about more tomorrow. So this is just an interesting use of this concept of transillumination, which helps us to identify, as you can see here, at least this perivalvular leak of regurgitation. So again, promised the syllabus, I had given it to them yesterday, it will be there for you, but just this little table that I sat on the plane making, thinking, how are we going to summarize all of this? Again, an elevated E-wave velocity and mean gradient just signal that something is wrong. It could be pathologic regurgitation. There you'd have a short pressure half time, but a high TVI ratio. It could be pathologic obstruction because you have a prolonged pressure half time over 130 as you go through that algorithm. Or it could be functional obstruction, where it could be prosthesis patient mismatch, where the pressure half time remains short, the TVI ratio remains normal, but the indexed valve area may be normal for the valve, but it's low. It's less than 1.2 centimeters squared per meter squared. Or it could simply be tachycardia or high flow states where everything would look normal, but tachycardia, of course, the heart rate would be fast, and high flow states, you would see the increased flow through the LVOT. I thank you very much for your time and attention. Steve, that was a phenomenal lecture. Um, just one just general statement. Uh, Marty, I think, addressed this earlier. Uh, just uh, as an act of courtesy, please silence your phones. Um, and put it, if you put it on vibration mode, please step outside to take your phone calls. Um, so a couple of questions uh, that came from the audience. Can you tell the difference between thrombus or versus panis on mechanical valve? Yeah, no, that's anatomically difficult. The timing can be useful because thrombus may be more of an acute change in the clinical syndrome where panis sort of grows in. Panis generally occurs around the, the annulus and encroaches, but I think anatomically, unless one of my colleagues here could tell me, it can be difficult to differentiate between thrombus and panis. Thrombus may be mobile, but it's usually the timing where there's more of an acute change in clinical symptoms that helps us to determine whether it's thrombus or panis. I don't know, Roberto or okay. Marty or, or Jerry, if you have any other thoughts. No. Uh, do cutaneous valves, I assume it's, we mean uh, TAVRs, and oh. uh, cutaneous valves have the same thrombosis rates as other bioprosthetic valves? Well, I don't know the exact answer, but as we showed in, the lecture, in, in this, the bioprosthetic valve thrombosis rate in the TAVR population looked at was around 2 to 3 percent. And so it's the similar type of thing that you want to take a look to see, has there been a progressive increase in the mean gradient? If you can see the leaflets, it's of course harder in the aortic, I think, than in the, in the mitral position. But if you can see the leaflets have become thickened, there's restricted motion, the patient's in atrial fibrillation, they have so forth that, and a subtherapeutic INR there would be at higher risk. And it's a little more common in the balloon expandable than the self-expanding valves. Um. One question came up, uh, again, not likely to appear on the boards. What about DOAC for mechanical and bioprosthetic valves instead of Coumadin? What's your practice? Yeah, so for the bioprosthetic valves? Yes. Yeah, so our practice is to anticoagulate these patients with uh, Coumadin, if they can tolerate Coumadin, for three to six months.
in both the aortic and mitral position. Just as the guidelines, it's a class 2A indication. And following that, we use single antiplatelet therapy, generally aspirin. Um, one, one if, I just would say that if they're not really candidates for Coumadin for whatever reason, then we could consider do, dual, but I don't really know we would consider the dual antiplatelet therapy, but generally we use Coumadin for both aortic and mitral position for those three to six months. One question came up. If um, indexed EOA is less than 1.2, if that is moderate PPM, how can we distinguish that from normal valve function? Well, in essence, I think it's on your slide here. Which one? But in essence, that in prosthesis patient mismatch, the valve is functioning normally. The issue really, though, is that these patients, so they have a high gradient, a high, uh, excuse me, E-way velocity. The pressure half time is low. I put this back up so we can see this. The TVI ratio is normal because the indexed orifice area is low. Therefore, by definition, this patient would have prosthesis patient mismatch. As I showed you in the, that final slide, the valve's functioning just fine. It's just too darn small for that patient's body. It's working okay. It's just you put too small a, a valve to for the size of the pump in the body. Okay. I think we'll let you off the hook. That was Perfect. fabulous. Thank Great you so Q and A. Thank you very much. I appreciate yes. that.